uh, you are perfect. Thank you, Hannah. So all of our meetings are being recorded, our workshops, I should say, uh, in order to post them on YouTube later on so that we can really spread the message of ELK and sort of make the distribution of these skills a little bit wider for those who cannot attend. So you feel free to keep your cameras off and only use the chat. But if you'd like to turn them on just when you're asking a question or contributing, that's all right too. So we're gonna go uh, start today off with a basic introduction of who we are, what ELK is, what we're gonna be talking about in the workshop, and then we'll dive right into things. Perfect. So we're gonna go over um, a territorial acknowledgement first. So for myself and my other ELK members, we're located today on the unceded and traditional and ancestral lands of the Clayton Tene Nation. We are grateful to be housed here, to be learning here, and to be collaborating here with you and members of their community. So very grateful for that. We'll see to the Clayton Tene. So ELK is a group of youth. We are brought together by the Fraser Basin Council for their co-creating a sustainable BC project. And the ELK initiative, the Eco Living Kitchen initiative is the project we came up with to spread the skills and information people need to have more sustainable kitchens. So we'll go through and just tell you our names and a little bit about ourselves. My name is Helga. I use all pronouns, but in this context, I like to stick to they, them to make other people more comfortable using those as well. Um, I'm a fourth year forestry and wildlands conservation student at UNBC. And I joined this project to connect with other youth around my community and to really try and have a little bit of an on the ground impact. We'll go to Shauna next and work our way across the screen. Hi everyone, so yeah, I'm Shauna. I use she, her pronouns. I am a third year environmental and sustainability studies student. Um, and I joined this program because similar to Helga, I really wanted to connect with other youth in my community. I'm not from Prince George, so I saw it as a really great opportunity to get to know our community a lot more and get more involved in sustainability in our area. Yeah, and I'll pass that over to Hannah. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm also going to UNBC with a our finishing in environmental and sustainability degree studies. Um, I joined this because I really like the idea of being able to implement a lot of things that I'm learning in my degree into my community and into like a real world context. And I've really been able to do that here. And then we'll go to Anne last. Thanks, Anna. Uh, my name is Anne and I'm a master's student at UNBC. And like everyone else here, I really want to connect with uh, my community and also uh, like-minded youth. Um, to raise awareness about environmental sustainability and initiatives. So thank you. Now back to Helga. Awesome. Thank you all. And there's quite a few of you here today. So in um, the effort to stay on time, we won't go through to get to know every one of you, but please feel free to put a little bit about yourself in the chat if there's something you'd like us to know. Um, for example, which indigenous territory you're on, uh, if we're likely to get your pronouns wrong accidentally, or just where you're from and where you heard about us would all be fantastic. But barring that, uh, the workshop structure here is to really create a collaborative learning environment. So we're not experts. We've assembled a lot of information. We have a lot of information and we do practice these things in our day-to-day -day lives for the most part. But we also recognize that there are people with a lot more experience and a lot more know-how out there partaking in workshops, but also in the wider world. So we really wanna to come together to create an inclusive, collaborative and inv kind environment where we can all sort of grow off of each other's strengths and create a space where we can say, hey, I don't know that, do you know that? And grow together. Next slide, Anne. All right. Also, please feel free to put in the chat uh, if I am talking too fast because I tend to do that sometimes in presentations, or perhaps Shauna can just give me a thumbs down to slow me down. <laughs> so let's talk about the kitchen context in specific. Kitchen waste is really challenging. It's super diverse. We have a ton of different waste and it's constantly coming in. So it has to be clean and it's really easy for it to get dirty. So recycling can be a challenge. And we buy groceries either fairly regularly or in bulk. So there's a lot of packaging attached to those regardless. 
And while recycling is a good option, sometimes trying to reduce that waste or reuse it is actually a better idea. And there are reasons for that. So as a society, and I say this as a Canadian society, a North American society, and a global society, we need to consume less plastic and less packaging in general. The statistic is that only 9% of the 3 million tons of plastic produced each year by Canadians alone are, is recycled. And that might be because we don't know how to recycle it, we're too busy to recycle it and such. But if we reduce the fact that we're using plastic entirely or stop using plastic entirely, that will become a much uh, smaller issue, right? So we need to try and decrease the amount of plastic we're using. Plastic is also challenging because it's one of the materials that can't be recycled infinitely. So things like tin and glass can be recycled a fair number of times, especially metals. They're pretty good to continue being recycled and recycled and recycled. But plastics have to be broken down through a chemical process, which actually damages the polymers that make them up so that they get weaker and weaker the more times that they're recycled. Most plastics can only be recycled up to two times before they're turned into some kind of fabric or clothing, which eventually has to go into the landfill. So we really want to decrease that. In some parts of the country and parts of the world, plastics have to be shipped overseas to be pop or not plastics, pardon me, recyclables in general have to be shipped overseas to be properly processed after they've been sorted. So that means breaking them down so that they can be used into different materials. Here in British Columbia, we're really lucky because in our province, we actually do everything um, in province. We have the necessary infrastructure, but some of the Eastern provinces have to ship those materials, those big <laughs> um, cubes of recycling to different places around the world who then do the processing. And this can be really challenging for developing countries who often take on that work and can lead to pollution and just an unequitable situation. In the same sense, Canadian provinces who can't send that waste away, that recycling to get sorted, end up with a backup so that the recycling doesn't actually go through the whole process. It just ends up sitting here in recycling facilities. And recycling is a huge and expensive process. It takes a lot of time and money to do it properly. And that can be challenging. Transportation of that recycling to places where it can be properly broken down, to places where it can be properly sorted from our curbsides to a larger facility. Those things all result currently, since we don't have any large scale electrical vehicles in a lot of carbon emissions. So we wanna try and reduce that as possible. So we reduce when we can't reduce, when we have to consume those things, we try and reuse. And then if we can't reuse it in a way that'll extend its life, then we go to recycling it. And hopefully some of the things we're gonna talk about in this workshop will help you do that. Okay, so we're just gonna sort of bring it back to an everyday context. Last workshop, I know not all of you were there, but we talked a bit about meal planning. And one of the meals we talked about was some pasta. So today I just wanna quickly go through and get everyone thinking about what kind of waste their meals generate by looking at a meal of pasta. So we buy pasta noodles. Pasta noodles usually come in kind of a crinkly plastic wrap, right? So all of a sudden we've got a plastic wrap and bag. Uh, I like to make my tomatoes or my pasta sauce from scratch. So I like to buy tinned tomato sauce. Now I've got a tin can. I want to chop some fresh basil in there. Well, sometimes basil, either you throw it in the plastic bag or it comes in one of these weird sort of bubble packs of harder plastic. So we're going to get the harder plastic one because maybe we can use that later. Carrots. If I went to caribou growers, I could get a nice big box of, or a cardboard box of carrots and that would be great. But if I'm down at Superstore, I'm gonna end up with some kind of plastic bag, unless I have my mesh shopping bag with me, which I usually do. But for the example, that's not the case. <laughs> um, my olives are gonna come in a big glass jar uh, or a tin, but in this case, we're gonna use a glass jar. Olive oil, I can buy it in a glass, I can buy it in tin, I can buy it in a plastic bottle, but it's some kind of bottle pouring device, right? And then oregano, salt and pepper, all my seasonings. Uh, unfortunately, they usually come in those little sort of plastic shakers or plastic bags if you're buying them in bulk. Or you can go to bulk food and get it in a more sustainable container. But 
these are just some of the things that you can get for sort of an average week meal. So what else is there? Uh, I'd love it if you could drop things in the chat. I've already seen the chat blowing up, but I haven't been able to keep up with it while I'm presenting that are some uniquely challenging things for the kitchen. Pardon me. So one of the things that I see a lot, I love tea and my family buys tea either loose or um, in bags that aren't wrapped. But a lot of my friends buy the, or will buy me, <laughs> the ones that come in individually wrapped little tea bag wrappers. Um, and so I have all these tea bag wrappers. And that's one thing that's really hard to recycle because sometimes they're coated with plastic on the inside. And so you have a paper plastic sort of chimera beast that's been all mushed together and it's a little bit more challenging. Um, but let's see what everyone else is saying. Clamshell containers. Yes. Those are like the ones for um, like the basil I was talking about or for salad greens. Yeah, mayonnaise. Oh, Don is in the States. Great to have you, Don. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually thinking of it, I haven't seen mayonnaise in glass here either. Has anyone else? No, I know the plant-based stuff that I buy is always in plastic. So it's frustrating. A good jar though, for a plastic jar. I put a picture of a stove here because within our kitchen, we also have appliances. So you're in your kitchen, you might have a toaster, you might have you know, a, a stove, uh, electric stove top, a microwave, a fridge, um, all those things of varying sizes depending on the space you have. But those are all also things we need to consider that we are consuming and eventually they will have to be replaced. Uh, milk jugs are here, yeah. So we have a really diverse range of waste, but what I wanna try and do now is stop thinking of it as waste and start thinking of it as material, as resources. Next slide, please, Anne. All right, so it's not the first time in history we've been asked to do this. For many of us, um, our grandparents or our great-grandparents were asked to do this before. And uh, many people around the world in less fortunate situations do this every day to make their livelihoods. Scrap and salvage is super important to us. And in our increasingly um, climate change conscious time, I would argue it needs to become that way again. And we need to tap into that creative energy that a lot of people had back during the Second World War and still continue to have even here in our country today. But I don't want us to be making more junk. So I know that there are a lot of cool kids art projects and, you know, sort of neat little things we can make to decorate our homes um, with these kind of supplies. But I really want to warn everyone against making things that you're going to throw out next week or next month or just things that, you know, aren't actually useful for your home. So if you aren't going to use it, it's better to recycle it, especially if you're turning it into a craft that is going to prevent it from being recyclable at all. Uh, my, one of my frustrations as a camp counselor was that we used to make things out of salvaged material, but by the time that we were done with it, it had hot glue and glitter and paint. And so essentially had become something that was no longer recyclable. So please, if you're doing these kinds of crafts with your kids or making things for your home, make sure you're actually extending the life of the object. Otherwise we're kind of, you know, working backwards instead of forwards. Next slide, Anne. Okay, let's get right into it. And I'm gonna encourage you to, if you don't see something on the screen here or I don't touch on something and you do it, please pop it into the chat. One of our other hosts will be looking at that and just sort of keeping up with what's in the chat and they can pipe in if they see something really cool. But I'm gonna be going through these fairly quickly. So plastics are tough. There's a lot of them in the kitchen. They're hard to avoid unless you're shopping bulk all the time and even then it can be a challenge. One of the things that my family has always done with plastics, whether that be yogurt containers, little kitty cup yogurt containers, um, milk jugs, any kind of bottle is to turn them into seed pots. So you cut off the top, you throw some soil in it, 
it's not dirt it's soil and then you put your seed in there and you water it and you make sure it's all good if you have one of those big salad uh, or green containers that has a lid on it you can cut the lid off throw that in the recycling or keep it and make a little greenhouse um, once again you put your soil and your seeds in there and you're good to go as long as you have proper drainage. So you might have to pinprick some holes in there. I've got this image online. I think it's a really aesthetic way to use um, milk jugs. I know, I don't think I've ever seen my dad make it look that pretty, but <laughs> but he likes to cut a milk jug in half and then peel it back, fill it with soil, and then he pops the top back on so that it creates this mini greenhouse for his tomatoes early in the season. And I just think that's a fantastic way to use these things. And if you wash them out, eventually you can recycle them again, as long as they're not completely falling apart, right? One of the things that's kind of tricky are those crinkly containers that you get with chocolates or with cookies or those kinds of things, the plastic wraps that have the little dips in them. But those are great for making drawer dividers. So I sometimes wear stud earrings and I've got a lot of those lying around. That can be great to just plop those earrings into the drawer dividers. If you have a shop, and you like to do a little bit of handiwork, you probably have lots of screws and washers and stuff lying around. And that's another great way to use those. Um, and if it's in your garage, you know, people aren't going to be like, why are you keeping your jewelry in plastic? Uh, but you're free to educate them if they say that to you anyway. Durable tags. For labeling our seedlings, we often cut up old um, yogurt containers because they're great to write on and you can use them season after season. You just can scrub the indelible marker off at the end of the summer and write something new on them. So that's really great. Water bottles. Uh, I stole this from a friend one time when I didn't have a water bottle. It's just like a pop bottle. <laughs> it works, right? One thing with all these, whether we're growing in our food in it or drinking from it, is that increasingly we're aware that all plastics, including our clothing, if it's made of a plastic material, gives off microplastics. And they tend to sort of bioaccumulate in us and then later on in the soil uh, after we pass on. And so that is something to be aware of. But at the same time, I think it depends on the kind of time scale you're looking at and how concerned you are about those. So it can be useful to, you know, if you're in a rush for a water bottle, grab one of these guys, give it a little bit of a longer life and then pop it in the recycling later. Ziplocs. So I didn't know until I came to university that some people think Ziplocs can't be washed and recycled or, and used again. Um, I know I have, we're using Ziplocs that I've seen since I was a kid, just wash them out, relabel them, <laughs> stick them back in the freezer. As long as you don't need them to hold liquid, they'll go on a really long time. And that goes for any size, including the little really thin sandwich bags. Those are just more plastic bags if you throw them in the garbage, but they can stay handy for longer. Storage containers for hiking. Glass is hard on hikes. It can break, it's heavy. I've done it, <laughs> I wouldn't do it again. Plastic bottles, plastic bags, super quick, super light, and you can use them over and over. And there are some really cool things. I've seen insulation for buildings where people have taken pop bottles and stuffed them full of plastic bags and then used that instead of the regular foam insulation that you can buy. So it's a pretty creative field getting in with plastics. All right, next slide. And I see that Shauna's popping some of the uh, links that are in the end of this presentation in the chat as we go, which is awesome. Thank you for that. Okay, glass. Glass is pretty easy. It's like Tupperware, but it's free, right? <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, I think pretty much all of our food is now stored in glass containers that we've found. And we actually buy things larger than we need at any one time so that we have a nice big glass container. You'll see this picture is from my house and those peppers are in, I think, an old pickle jar. And we always buy more pickles than we need because they don't go bad in the fridge. But you also have a fantastic flour container or spice container afterwards. So we reuse to store other foods. Some jars, including jam jars that you buy from the store, even if they have you know a design on the lid, they can be used again for canning and preserves if they reseal. Not all of them reseal, but it can be worth it to give it a shot. We've had fairly good luck with that in my home. Bottles can still hold liquids. They're good for homemade apple cider vinegar or apple cider vinegar in general, or your kombucha, if you're making kombucha at home. Candles, leave behind candle holders. 
And those are still useful, especially if they're pretty, as many are now, <laughs> um, for tea lights and such. So you can buy scented tea lights and throw them back in the candle holder. Or you can save up wax scraps and melt down and make your own candles later on and give them out as gifts. And then you keep that um, candle holder going through the system in a sort of reciprocal way, which can be really great. Once again, appealing glass holders can be used to hold toothbrushes or pens. I know I use one on my desk. It's uh, just a pretty green color that used to be a candle. And now it holds my pens and pencils and stuff for when I'm studying. And then jars with screw on lids can really help organize a shop or garage. I saw this at my boss's place last summer. He had a bar on the ceiling of his shop, pardon me, that he had screwed on, he had screwed the screwed on lids to a two by four. And then he had glass jars filled with all of the nuts and bolts he needed screwed onto their screw on lids. And whenever he needed them, he would just unscrew them, but it didn't take up any space on his shop tables, on his walls, so he could have all of that for tools. And I thought that was really ingenious. I was just a little bit shorter than him, so I couldn't quite get them, but aside from that, it worked pretty well. Next slide, Anne. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so tin, I see tin a lot in like kids art projects kind of stuff. And if you can't think of a way to recycle or to reuse your tin, that's okay. It's actually really recyclable and it can be recycled nearly infinitely. But they are useful outside, especially if they're, if they're of a certain size. And it can be handy to have some around, but don't feel bad if you have to recycle these is the sort of long and short of it. With a little paint, large tin cans can be planters and buckets. I know my dad made some hanging baskets with these. You just have to make sure to paint them with a paint that's gonna prevent them from rusting or the bottoms will fall out. That's the only issue. And then they're not recyclable quite as well anymore. Um, Tin lanterns are easy to make. That's a really cool art project and can actually be quite beautiful. Just don't go sticking glitter and glue and all kinds of fan dangling stuff on it. Just use your hammer and a nail uh, and tap some designs into that. And those can be really quite pretty. Great to do with kids too. If they get to draw the design and then you tap it in for them or if they're older, they can do it themselves. They are great painted and nailed to a board in a shop, once again, to organize screws, washers, and small tools. To have all of your screwdrivers in one large tin can is a blessing, okay? <laughs> it's a blessing. <laughs> and then finally, um, in my house, we always make Italian panettone for Easter, and we always need those big tin cans. And so we purposely buy things in those big tin cans leading up to Easter so that we have those. And then we just keep them year after year but that's a really handy use for it too. And it doesn't have to be super yeasty breads. You can make other breads in them as well, but it's a good thing to try out. All right, appliances. I will admit I'm weak on the appliances. I haven't reused many appliances yet in my life, but I have salvaged from some of them. So one thing I would say first is that you should connect with your neighbors and the community around you. Some people really like to fix these things and they're good at fixing these things, even when your official appliance companies might not want to. Um, and they might also want to show you how. A lot of people who tinker are really passionate about tinkering <laughs> and would love to get more people on board. So that's a great option. However, if it is beyond repair or you don't know anyone or you don't have those resources, there are still some options. And this is just, these are just a few. Freezers uh, can become watering troughs for animals. I also have seen them used as bookshelves just with the door removed and also for smaller freezers um, for nightstands that keep things inside. And those can also be painted and made to look sort of prettier if they're in rough shape. Grills, we have old grills from a stove from the house we moved into and we just threw them on the fire pit out back and now they work perfect for cooking on the open fire. So that's a great way to use them. Um, and then you can always salvage the hardware. All these things have hinges, they have screws, they have nuts, they have bolts. If you are a little bit more of a tinkerer, you might be able to get the actual elements off the top of your stove, all of those kinds of things. So the doors off of stoves can be reused. It's really, it's a challenging but diverse in what you can do with these. And then finally cardboard. 
cardboard is kind of our friend. <laughs> it's, it's not a super hard one to um, reuse. I think composting cardboard and using it as your carbon input into your compost is fantastic. It's super fast. You can pull all the tape off, but if you're working with really sort of well-used moving boxes, you can also put it in the composter and pull it out later when you're turning it. And that works just as well. It's great to line garden beds and kill the grass underneath instead of using black plastic. Um, works just as well. And that way you know it'll eventually compost into the ground. And then you can reuse boxes for storing things like root vegetables or you know, outside gear, things like that. So now I know the chat has been exploding, but if anyone has a really creative, cool, um, here's how I salvaged this, here's how I reused this story, please pop it in the chat now and I will um, read it out and then I'll tell you mine, which is all credit to my mother who comes up with most of this stuff. All right, I've got one in the chat from Margaret. One of my friends uses an old refrigerator with a latch built into a cabinet with extra foam installation as cold storage. Oh, that's excellent for vegetables, etc. Cooler than room temperature, chilled by ice and blocks frozen in milk or water jugs. Nice, that's a great idea. I really like that. That's like a um, root cellar. Very cool. So um, my mom always buys <laughs> the gigantic version of the ketchup, the Heinz ketchup. I'm not sure if you've seen it. It comes in huge tin cans. So we always buy that because she doesn't want to buy the little plastic ones. And then we go through this several minute process of transferring all of the stuff that is in that large one into the old plastic containers that we have and any glass jars that happen to be lying around. And then all of that ketchup goes into our fridge. And then we're left with a tin can that we can either bake in or that can be recycled. But that way we keep the plastic, We extend the plastics life, but we also only produce the tin and keep everything else in the fridge. So that's the, that's the, my mom's strange way of going about it. Anyone else in the chat or one of my co-hosts got a fun reusing story? I would say maybe not so much of a, the most like out there sort of thing, but I know in our house, we do like to propagate plants as well. So our old glass jars get used for propagating plants. I know you can buy those like little cutesy ones that get set up as a com like a complete propagating station. But yeah, we just use our old glass jars for those. And that's a really great way to go about it. And starting with the dog house rather than the dog, which is maybe nice for the dog when it eventually shows up. Oh, nice. Yep, the Adam's peanut butter jars. Yeah, so there's lots of things you can do, right? And some of them, like, like they don't have to be out there, like Shauna said, like as long as they're effective and it actually results in you reusing it rather than, you know, throwing it away or putting it in the recycling right away, that's good. That's what we want. So it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to build a house all out of it. <laughs> it's all good. Oh yeah, and semi bulk foods. Absolutely. Bread tags, good one, Leanne. Yeah, and um, you know, the elastics that you get or the twist ties you get around um, some produce, for example, broccoli is the only one I can think of. Those are great for hoarding elastics because elastics for some reason are really expensive or especially right now because of masks but yeah i like the bread tag one awesome all right i think that's the end of my section so thank you for listening to me for this long everybody excuse me and i think we're going to take a really quick five minute bio break before we head into the next piece just to give everyone an opportunity to get up and stretch their legs and go to the washroom if they need to.
Okay, so hopefully everyone's back now. We're going to start up again on the next section. Um, so here I'm going to be talking about leftover food and what to do with it. Um, so one of the best ways to reduce food waste, food waste is to freeze it. If that food is, if you can freeze that food, we'll get into that later. Um, Cause it'll extend the shelf life. And you know, if you forget about it for a month or two, it's not the end of the world as opposed to if you left it in your fridge, that would be really bad. Um, but there's important tips and tricks and there's many more on the internet than we have here, but we can all discuss it also in the chat um, to make sure that you increase the shelf life of your food and you can avoid problems like freezer burn. So the first tip that I have is to wrap it as tightly as possible. Um, if there's too much air contact with the food for too long, it can, that's one of the main causes of freezer burn and it can reduce the flavor and it kind of makes it gross. And obviously that ends up wasting food if it, if it gets freezer burn and you're not gonna wanna eat it. Uh, next tip that we have is that to freeze your food in portions. So it's not always safe to refreeze foods after they've been thawed due to bacteria forming. And it also can degrade the color texture and the flavor of the food. So if you portion your food to one or two portions, you can accurately thaw how much food you want to eat or to serve. And so instead of thawing everything at once and refreezing it and possibly wasting it, you're only thawing as much as you need. And there's many ways to do that. I've seen where people put it in plastic bags and they make indents in the food with like a chopstick or a fork or something. And that portions off how much you need and you can just cut that out. Um, you can get with ice cube trays, you can portion uh, broth or people have used tea or just different um, kind of liquids that you can only use as much as you need instead of uh, keeping it all in your fridge or in a giant jar that's hard to um, get only some of it out as opposed to where you have to thaw the entire thing. Uh, the next tip we have is to mark the date uh, you put the food in your freezer and when it will expire. I feel like many people do this. I know my mom does this. She wraps all of the meat that she buys and marks the date. So our freezer is, our freezer is just full of red paper wrapped meat with all kinds of labels on it. But it's really important to um, know when you put the food in the freezer and when it should expire. Often there's all over the internet, lots of tips and we'll get into that of how long thing, certain things can stay in the freezer. So if you keep track of that and you know when to use it, then you'll know which food you, foods use first, especially if you might not know what's in it, if the, if the packaging kind of hides uh, that. Sorry, and then the last trick is uh, using glass. Often people are nervous to use glass to freeze food because it can explode if, uh, with pressure and um, expanding liquids. Um, but first tip that I would offer is to leave two inches of space from the top of your container so that as the liquid uh, expands, as it freezes, it won't burst anything and you know get glass into your food. And the second one is to let it cool in your fridge overnight. So just pour whatever you want to freeze into the glass container and let it cool off overnight and then put it in the freezer. Um, and you can freeze it uncovered till solid just in case it will go over. And then once it's frozen, you can put lids and labels on and it likely will not explode on you, which bonus. And then you're reusing glass, like we talked about earlier with Helga and all the better for the environment. So on this next slide, I think uh, many people kind of think that you can freeze, you know, anything, any kind of food. I definitely know that I thought that frog, so I didn't think there was, I think you just put whatever in the fridge, in the freezer, cause you know, it's frozen, nothing bad can happen to it. Uh, that is not the case. So you can freeze most things. So here on the um, on the left, here's things that you can freeze and the shelf life of those frozen foods. Most of them are obviously, you can see here many months. So you've got a lot of, uh, a, a large time frame to uh, freeze these foods and eat them later. 
which is much better than in your cupboards or in your fridge, which is at most maybe two weeks. Um, some foods that you might be able to freeze or can't freeze include eggs, potatoes, uh, dairy-based products, uh, high water content vegetables. So there's a number of reasons for those. Um, first one that I have listed is fried food. So oil in the fried food can seep into the food and it gets soggy. Uh, salad greens can turn to goop, which you may want to do if you want to blend it into some kind of dip or dish. But if you wanted to reuse it as a salad, I have to advise against that. Um, mayo, it separates or other egg-based sauces will separate and curdle when they get frozen. That's gross. Don't eat that. Um, so yeah, high water content vegetables. So they'll go soggy with like cucumbers, tomatoes, radishes. They'll go soggy when you um, thaw them. And then once again, it creates more food waste. And um, you won't, because you won't be eating that. Um, eggs, they can expand because they're technically kind of a liquid and it'll crack the shells and they can get freezer burn. So the best way to go about that is both with raw and cooked eggs is to take them out of the shell before you freeze them. Uh, rice um, has bacteria spores on it that survive the cooking process. And so that's why it's kind of important to eat it sooner than later so that it doesn't multiply as quickly and get you sick. And if the cooling process takes too long, uh, they definitely multiply quite rapidly in a warm environment and they can become dormant if you freeze and reheat them regularly. So rice is kind of, um, here it says you can't freeze. I think you can if it's immediate, but it's kind of like a, an iffy thing. So it's very important to keep track of what you do and don't want to freeze. Kind of refer back to our last meal planning workshop where if you're planning what you want to eat and what you don't want to eat, then you'll know uh, what things to include immediately, what things are perishable that you also can't freeze that you should include in your meal and eat within the week that you bought it, and other things that you can make or store in the freezer and you can use for future meal planning. Yeah, so we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about recycling. And I'm so sorry, but my video is not working. So, but I am here, I promise. Um, so recycling is probably the least popular kid out of that triad there, because as Helga mentioned, um, it's really, really important to think about reducing, reusing. So doing that first. And then if you absolutely can't do those things, then recycling. Um, of course, it's probably not an option for people who have accessible, accessibility issues or you know, who have um, other barriers um, to reduce or reuse. So in that case, recycling is really important to make sure that you extend the lifetime of um, that packaging as much as possible and it can be reused in sort of a circular economy um, way. So I think the best way to explain how to recycle is probably to refer you to a couple of resources and links. And so I'm going to be doing that. Um, and um, all these resources are available online. And uh, a lot of you probably have these resources um, probably on your fridge or kept somewhere accessible. Um, and I really recommend you do that because there's a lot of things that, um, or materials that um, can be recycled and it's sort of hard to keep track of which can and can't be. So first off, I wanna talk about curbside recycling. So that's where, you know, um, every two weeks or so, um, the garbage uh, truck or the recycling truck comes over and they just grab uh, your recycling. And um, for sure, when you are considering curbside recycling, uh, think about um, sorting them, first of all, because they don't really like it when you put everything in one box. So um, make sure you sort recycling into uh, one blue box is paper, one blue box is containers, and most recently, they implemented something in December where you can actually recycle your glass now in a gray box. And I'm going to pull up the little leaflet here, the recycling guide. How many of you guys have this? 
I know, Don, you probably don't because you live in the US, but um, I'm, I apologize if this is very applicable to you. Um, but probably there is something similar where you live as well. There's probably a recycling guide and recycling schedules. So you know exactly when to put your recycling out. Um, and here at the bottom, and I keep this on this fridge, so in, in, on my fridge so that I know exactly what to put in the box, um, is how to sort them out and what is accepted and what is not accepted. So you can see in the first box um, for paper, what's accepted is things like magazines, newspapers, uh, molded paper. So what you get when you go to Timmy's um, and cardboard boxes, of course, um, envelopes, uh, box board boxes. Um, so things like cereal boxes you can put in there in paper bags. Um, oh, and Margaret said that in an apartment. So, oh really, there's only one box? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I actually rent in a house, so I actually had no idea in apartments you only have one box. Hmm, okay. <laughs> that's a bit of a dilemma, but if that's the case, there's also another solution, um, which I will talk about a bit later. Um, but that's good to know. Thanks for sharing, Zala and um, Margaret. And then in the second blue box, you have containers. So things like plastic bottles. So if you buy any orange juice, you can put that in there. Um, plastic trays and clamshells uh, that Helga was talking about, the ones that hold the strawberries and all things like that, um, berries um, and plastic and paper takeout cups. So if you order a lot of skip the dishes, you can probably put that in that blue box there. Um, make sure you do rinse them out before you put them there though. So, um, and then of course, metal cans, but as Helga said, you can use them for many other things. So um, just put that in as a last resort. Uh, aerosol can, so if you use a lot of whipped cream for um, baking, then you can put that in there too. Uh, foil wrap, cartons for soup and milk, and plastic garden pots and ceiling trays. But why would you want to recycle those? Just use them <laughs> if you can, again. And then of course, in the glass, you can put like wine bottles and things like pickle jars and such. Um, but again, you can always use them for storing things and putting uh, bulk foods. Uh, not all apartments even have the gray box. Is that right? So there's only one, there's a cardboard blue bin. Wow, really? Is that set by the, the apartment building manager or the strata or something or? I know that many apartments are partnered with a private waste management company. Um, and in that oh. case, it is often because of what the what services the company offers. And it could also be what your apartment has selected for services they'll use. So, yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, that's good to know. All right. And over here on the far right, you can see drop off only takes to recycling depot. So there are certain things that um, won't be accepted at the curbside recycling that you can drop off at the recycling depot. However, as Margaret mentioned, it is a real struggle <laughs> to try to get there. Sometimes the PG return it center, which is probably the most comprehensive center that accepts pretty much everything else. Um, I know it was personally difficult for me to get there. So, um, oh, I see. Very interesting to get that perspective. Yeah, I didn't know that. Thanks for sharing about the apartment situation. Mm -hmm. Do they have any other alternatives then? So the private companies, do they take the rest of the recyclables? Or they just put it all in the dump? <laughs> yeah, I That's think it's, it depends on the company we are partnered with. Oh, interesting. Okay. All right, and then we could use some kind of like a dump run co-op if someone has a vehicle and no one else does, or not a dump run, but a, re a return it run. We could all get together and go to the recycling depot together in not COVID times, obviously, but that would be kind of cool. Yeah, totally. Okay, and then here is um, a link to the returnit.ca site, and here, you can find all the different recycling uh, depots that are close to you. So if I type in Prince George, um, then you can see here, um, there's a couple of return it centers, but I like the 
PG of recycling and return it center simply because um, they accept more things. They accept appliances and other things as well, which is awesome. Um, so if I go over here and I go to details, you can see when they're open and what they actually accept. And another cool thing that the province has basically um, just started in 2019 actually is allowing people to recycle things like flexible plastic packaging, which traditionally you couldn't recycle at all. Um, and what are they using it for? They're actually using it partly to create engineered fuel, which is interesting, um, what I read. Um, so yeah, if we go over here, here's the materials list and you can find this on the Recycle BC link, um, the other one, the third one in that slide. Um, and here it then reiterates what you can put in the paper, the container box, and also what can be accepted at the depots. And so here's a drop off. So things like plastic bags, overwrap. So um, wrapping for bread and other things like that, paper towels, the carrot bags, all those things, um, they can be uh, dropped off at the recycle, uh, return it center. Um, and things like foam food containers and trays as well. And foam cushion packaging is not really applicable except if you get an appliance and there's some foam uh, packaging in there. So you can also recycle those. Um, and then things like Ziploc bags and other flexible packaging, like uh, the ones for chips, you can actually recycle those, which is great because I know as students, we love to eat chips and I know it's a guilty pleasure of mine. So <laughs> it's nice to be able to do that for sure. And then other flexible pa pa packaging includes things like um, the packaging that you get when you buy meats and stuff. Um, so those all can be uh, recycled at the return center. Yeah, and then also, um, I think there was something in the chat about those um, onion net mesh bags. So you can actually uh, use it for soap and um, to make the soap more effective, but you can also recycle them too if you have too many of them. So, and also the rice bags, you can recycle there as well. Yeah, and things like shipping envelopes and plastic air packets and bubble wrap, you can also drop off at the drop it center, uh, return it center, pardon me. So yeah, and then over on the right side, you can see what not to include. So this is a really helpful resource and I recommend all of you guys have this handy um, at some point when it comes time to recycle, just make sure that you sort everything and you make sure that what you're throwing away, it can be recycled. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to my slide here. So I went through all those links and just to demonstrate how much plastic recycling we actually produce, uh, even though we don't want to. <laughs> This is my plastic packaging um, that I put into a huge uh, potato bag. So these are all plastics here. And this was accumulated over two and a half years. Um, and this is a two person household uh, with my roommate. And you can see that it's still a lot of plastic. So imagine how much plastic we produce every single uh, day. Um, and this, I compressed it a lot. So, um, and uh, this was just so that I could find a time to ask a friend to actually drop it off at the PG Return It Center, because as Margaret mentioned, it's very, very difficult to get there by public transport, especially in the winter. So um, it's sort of nice if you have a friend who can, um, you know, drive you there or can pick these up for you, that would be great. But if not, it sort of sucks to have all of this stored somewhere in your closet, which was what happened to me. <laughs> yeah. So let's go to a quick activity. Um, we're gonna just go through uh, all these items and then just uh, put in the chat um, where it should go if you're going to recycle it. Because of course, if you can't reduce or reuse, you have to recycle it. So um, we'll start with the egg carton. So where do we put that? Just very quickly, you can shout it out or put in the chat. And co-hosts, you can participate too. <laughs> well, I would reuse that by cutting it up and using each of those little discs to start a uh, plant. Or I just throw it in the yeah. compost. Also great for starting fires in the winter. If you have a wood 
heat at home. Yeah, great idea. So yes, try to reuse it. <laughs> but if not, then Jody and Margaret is right. You put it in the curbside recycling in the paper um, bin or cardboard. How about this Goya packaging, the plastic one? What do you do with that? Yeah, Recycling Depot. Thanks, Jody. <laughs> okay, how about the plastic packaging and the foam packaging for the meats? It's Recycling Depot again, but I'm not, I think they said no shrink wrap in that um, slide you showed us. Oh yes, you're right. So that was a trick one. So yes, no shrink wrap. <laughs> you can wash it and use it for something else. If exactly, yes. And also make sure to take the something. sticker out too, <laughs> as well. Okay, great. How about the oranges in the net bag? Recycling Depot, thanks Jody. Okay, how about this clamshell uh, packaging? Yes, that's right. Yes, you can make dish scrubbies from them. I think that was mentioned today too. Yep. Curbside, you could yes. also Thanks. reuse them like Helga mentioned earlier because I know the strawberry ones have the holes in the bottom. So if you were planting something in it, there's the drainage holes that you would need. Yeah, great idea. Yeah, so you can definitely use that for gardening. It's a great tip. But then if not, you can uh, put it in the container blue bin. Um, and uh, that's perfectly acceptable too. Okay, how about the Rotini box? You can go curbside, but you have to remember to take out the little plastic window that they put in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a trick one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So make sure you do that because yeah, that, that definitely doesn't go with the cardboard. <laughs> yeah. Yes, remove the cellophane. Thank you, Leanne, yep. And then sure. you can compost the cardboard if you want. Mm -hmm. Or you can use it as compost. <laughs> oh, sorry. How about the classical jars? Curbside, yes. So you put it in with the containers, or sorry, the glass one, the glass one, the gray one, sorry. Pardon me. Safe for canning or bulk burnings. Yes, agreed. But if you absolutely can't and you have too many of them and you're like, I want to get rid of them, then yeah, <laughs> put it in the gray box. Okay, how about the ketchup chips? Anyone? That's another depot run. Yes, that's right. Yes. Wash it out first yes. though, because they're greasy. Oh yeah, totally. So wash them out as Helga said, and then recycling depot. Yeah. I didn't know that too, <laughs> but yeah, you totally can bring it to the recycling depot. Yay. Um, okay, how about the whole kernel corn? So it has the tin as well as some paper on it. You can pull the paper off. Sometimes it helps if you um, just quickly run it underwater first because then it'll loosen a little. It doesn't turn mm -hmm. to sludge quite yet, but it loosens, yep. pull it off. Um, yeah, and Leanne said put the lid in the sharpest box. Yes. Oh, yes, because it's so sharp. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really yeah. good tip. Mm -hmm. um, but you can pull the pop top off too, and then you can stick it at the bottom of the can, and then you compress the top of the can, 
and because mm -hmm. of the popped up shape it can't turn on its side and slide out so it's effectively mm -hmm. held within the tin can the tip and that way our recycling folks don't end up cutting themselves <laughs> yeah awesome so it is curbside yes in the container blue bin okay and last but not least um how about these uh, this plastic packaging for the carrots I have a bunch of number 10 cans of plastic lids. I use one as a can trips container. Oh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's a good way to put all of them together and then just recycle them later. And that plastic bag can go to the recycling depot. Yeah. Okay. But you can always stuff your other plastics into it so it's easier to take to the recycling depot, just as you did in your plastic yes, bags in the closet. Totally. <laughs> it was like a, it's like a real environmental skeletons in the closet kind of parable where you it just is. have all this plastic in your closet <laughs> yeah it, it looks terrible but <laughs> we'll have to get rid of it finally <laughs> okay great that was a really fun exercise thanks for doing that with me guys so the last resource I want to point you to is this smartphone app called BC Recyclopedia, and it sort of acts the same thing as a Recycle BC sort of PDF that I showed, showed you. So you can put in uh, whatever material that you want to recycle, um, or you want to inquire whether it could be recycled, and then it will show you the nearest location to recycle your item. So I think that's super useful, and all of you guys should download it if you can. I haven't used it yet, but I think it's super cool that something like that exists. Okay. Now on to Shauna for the discussion questions. Yeah, so just looking back on all that we discussed today, I mean, there's definitely a few pieces uh, that came up just now in our recycling piece of people not being sure that they could, what they could recycle or not even knowing that they could recycle some things. And we've talked a bit about different pieces that you can reuse in different ways to reduce. Um, but what are some items you find tricky to reduce, reuse, or recycle? Um, whether it's one that you're just thinking of, like, I'm not sure what I would do with it, or one that you have experience with, um, feel free to put it in the chat for that, or just speak out loud, turn your mic on and share what you found tricky. Yogurt cups is one. And would that be for uh, recycling? I know like the those little yogurt cups when it gets to so many of them. Uh, and depending on how many you're going through a day, it can be a bit tedious to go through. If they have a outer paper wrapping on them that you have to peel off, actually rinsing them out before you recycle them so that they still can be recycled. Um, something super easy. I know Helga mentioned as well, using those ones really well for uh, starting seeds is a great option there. So especially right now where we are in spring and looking towards really the planting season, if you've got a lot kicking around, it's a great time to be starting your seeds in those. The little yogurt cups, my mom likes to make jello pudding and like there's little desserts in the yogurt cups. And if it's a little glass jars and you can't find a use for them, people will post them on the buy nothing groups or whatever groups they're near their neighborhood. And people, people do want them and need them. So people do, pretty much you can put anything on there. People want or need it and they'll ask, I, I'll take it, I'm interested, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's awesome for sure. Um, I don't think we've touched on that too much today, but reaching out to your community, if you can't make use of something, there's most oftentimes, uh, there's somebody out there who will want to make use of it. So yeah, that's a really great opportunity. And that buy nothing group, I know we talked a bit about that one last week. I'm not sure if we have one of those groups in Prince George, but even other food hub Facebook pages or uh, waste reduction pages, or even our elk Facebook, if you want to take us to that, we, we're happy to share. And thanks Helga for putting that link there in the chat too. And another piece for finding tricky, Margaret shared, uh, anything that takes with space while you wait to use or dispose of it. Yeah, and I know you're saying in the chat as well, 
being in a small apartment, it is tricky that keeping these things or collecting them to make sure you can recycle them is, is quite a challenge. And Jale also put in the chat, and apologies if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly there, um, but also put in the chat, remo removing cellophane and labels from containers. I know that is one that drives me crazy sometimes. Those, just those little labels on pasta boxes, I don't, I don't understand why I need to see the pasta. I'm, I'm not doubting that they put it in the box or anything. Um, so yeah, those ones are quite annoying. Any other tricky items for folks? There's a problem with those. If you ever order to take out the paper containers with like the wax plastic insides, really impossible basically to separate it. So it's kind of ends up in the trash, which is annoying because it's cardboard on the outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fun story with that one. Hannah and I have actually <laughs> spent a good half hour or so standing next to each other trying to figure out what to do with those boxes. We just stood there Googling it, trying to find the answer, could not for the life of us figure out if we could recycle it or not. Not always easy to find the answer you're looking for. We also had tea bag wrappers in the chat. Uh, I also struggle with that one. And I know uh, not every not all tea bags come in a wrapper um, and you can't always see either inside the box if they have that additional wrapper. Um, for example, but the then you get into your tiny window. Yeah, I guess that's where the window comes in. <laughs> if there's extra packaging inside. Yeah. Yeah, but buying like bulk tea in larger quantities is the solution, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I know that in the terms of the takeout containers, um, I recently saw a takeout container that said compostable and I was super excited. And then I looked closer and it said compostable only in an industrial facility. And I was like, ah, how do I get it to said industrial facility? <laughs> so I think there's, they're coming out absolutely, Margaret, but sometimes they're a little bit sneaky. Mm -hmm. And for those ones as well, it is, uh, it can be different depending on where you're located. For us in Prince George, we don't have access to that industrial composting facility. Um, perhaps those of you in the States might be lucky enough to have that, or even, you know, there's other cities in Canada that do have those. Um, so that's another conversation. If you stay tuned for our workshop series, we'll actually be talking about uh, composting here in Prince George and outside of Prince George later on in one of our workshops. But yeah, that's a tricky one for sure. So we'll jump into our next question there. Uh, why? Oh, yeah, go for it. Do you know, can you recycle the lids to the little yogurts, like the little yogurt cups? Are the lids to those recyclable? Yes, you can. It's actually included as part of the other flexible plastic packaging at the recycling depot. So as long as you wash them and put it in there uh, with the other flexible plastic packaging, then you can totally do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. I feel like our yogurts have a little foil. It's a foil top, so that can be recycled. Oh yeah, the foil top ones. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I thought you meant the, the plastic ones, but yeah, the foil ones, definitely you can. Awesome. Uh, so I'll go into that next question now. Uh, why is a lack of knowledge on reducing, reusing and recycling? common. I mean, among the 10 of us here today, there's, I mean, we've, I've definitely learned some things even from those of you contributing in the chat. Uh, but why is it that we don't all just already know all this information when it's something that's really affecting our day to day lives? I think our cities and municipalities um, have a lot to do with it. Um, a year, well, not last year, I guess the year before 2019. Um, my city did something at like, at the city hall town hall area and literally had a mascot and then people dressed up in like different recyclable items. And then they showed you the blue, in our city it's blue cans or blue bins, recyclable, recyclable bins. And it would teach you like, do I belong here or here or here or that sort of thing. Um, I think there needs to be like your local, local government has to do something about it and get the word out, that sort of thing. Whether it's a big PR event like this was or little pamphlets because some people aren't online and some people you know don't watch the news or something. 
but that also generates more trash, you know, <laughs> it's like you're putting these pamphlets in people's um, mailboxes or something. But I mean, it's a cute idea. It sticks in your head so that you know, okay, that greasy pizza box, not recyclable, but a clean copper box, that's recyclable. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's a pretty cool event to hear about. And I'd definitely be interested in seeing that. I think that's also uh, having events like that where they're educational, you're getting to learn about things, um, but you also get to, together with the community for pieces like that. Um, so events like that is really nice. And like yeah. you said, it does stick in your head a bit more. It's a bit more memorable that way. The line was really, really long because <laughs> picking up these blue bins. I'm like, what is like my whole half my city out there? Like, don't you people have to work? <laughs> <It's> like, <we're... laughs> yeah. So, and we also have in the chat here from Margaret, a flyer for every household and so many end up in the trash rather than being read or used for reference. Yeah, I know when the, uh, the gray glass bins came out in Prince George, they did distribute uh, paper ones with them for households and ours is sitting on our fridge, but I'm sure many people are not sticking it to their fridge or keeping it in the drawer to remember and pull out. Um, so yeah, I'm sure there's quite a lot of trash being produced by that. And I guess that also raises a question for the city or the company that's doing your waste management is like, well, if you're trying to properly manage waste, why are you creating more uh, in the process? But yeah, overall, I think this, uh, what we're hearing is this lack of knowledge really being a lack of education or access to it. Um, like one piece that was mentioned, not everybody is online. So if you're not online, where can you learn about it? And where can you find those resources? And also from Margaret in chat here, there are generational differences too. The older a population is, the more resistant to change. And that is a really fantastic point that I think we're seeing a lot of here and kind of like the sustainability conversation is that not everybody is willing to change their ways or um, take on new habits. So it is, it is hard. The funny and thing is like, my grandparents were the one who taught me how to like separate the recycle the recyclables because in their city which is two or three states away from me in the u.s there um you you had to separate your glass your um plastics your paper and everything because they warned me as a six-year-old uh, you get fined if you put things in the wrong container and i'm like oh okay because my city had not at that point started a recycling program yet and so in their city, they had to, and I saw, I used to look at the windows of the truck as it was coming through during the summertime. And you could see it three compartments and they had to like separate them out because each thing was in one compartment. So it was really cool. As a little kid, I thought it was really cool. Yeah. And cool the, the plastic, uh, the two liter, yeah, two liter soda bottles, we would see, like I always wondered, like, why are they saving them all up? And then like one day they took them to the supermarket with them. And there was a machine, sort of like a giant soda machine, but you stuck your bottles in there and they would crush it up and then give you like a nickel or a quarter for each bottle you returned. And so you got money for those. I was wondering, I'm like, why are they keeping all those? Because they kept it on their porch outside. And I'm like, why? <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, and uh, one interesting piece there is a fine on improperly sorting your waste. What could that look like in other communities as well as an interesting um, so present, for governments to use. presently in my city, apparently the government has, has enough money to, to use to do this. There are people whose job it is to go around to all the neighborhoods and on tra the night before trash morning, what, trash night, whatever, they go around and they look at your trash and they look at your bin to see if you have recyclables in there. And if you put something that's supposed to be recycled into your trash versus your recyclables, they take a picture of it and then you get this receipt that's a $50 to $100 fine if you don't properly recycle. Wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. And yeah, I wonder what that could look like in perhaps smaller cities or cities that uh, maybe don't have the resources or means to fund like a whole initiative for it. But what other ways could we uh, encourage proper waste sorting and recycling sorting? Uh, in a, I like the incentive. Mm -hmm. I like, I, I don't like the punishment side of it, but I like the incentivizing people of, like you could say like, okay, if you go to whatever recycling areas and you bring X amount of pounds of whatever, 
and you get this dollar amount, you know, not like a nickel or whatever, but because it's like a nickel a quarter isn't worth it for some people. But if you say like, if you bring like five pounds of whatever, you get this that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that's one thing my father's <laughs> pretty big on is being able to bring like empty cans and stuff to the recycling center to get money back. He would always have like garbage bags full of like so many cans to just bring to the recycling center. And as a kid, that's something that I remember too, is actually then going to the bottle depot with him to like go and dump off all these cans, get the money for it. And for me, that also meant getting some candy because I always have the little candy jars <laughs> in the bottle depot. Um, so yeah, it's a really effective way to do it. They had this program where, because they had sponsorship for it, for the recycling program here, and they would put a, like a UPC sticker on your recycle bin. And I guess when the truck would go through to pick up everything, every week I would get a notification in my email saying, you have 25 points for properly recycling this week. And then you add up all your points and you can get magazines and gift cards for them. But that was when they had sponsorship. Now there's no longer sponsorship. Mm -hmm. Still pretty interesting programs to hear about. Very cool. Thanks for sharing. Um, Welcome. Yeah, we'll hop on to this next question, just looking at the time here. Uh, so we've talked a bit about this throughout our workshop today is the barriers that you face in trying to reduce, reuse, or recycle kitchen waste. Um, even now in the chat, Margaret's put in a concern for people with disabilities who might not have the energy reserves or ability to do everything required. And, it's, and we've also talked about not everybody having access to the internet to find resources to make sure they can do it correctly. Um, yeah, what other barriers do people see? So one of my neighbors posted that she needed somebody's help like Tuesday nights to take you know, the trash to the curb because of her disabilities for her and her daughter. And everyone in the neighborhood, like on the Facebook page, like, you know, um, chimed in and said, I'll do it, I'll do it. I'll, like at first she was like offering money. We're like, we'll do it for free. Like, you know, I'll take this. To, and then we ended up doing a calendar so that people can like volunteer to help her out on Tuesday nights and be more organized about it. That's fantastic. Another really awesome way for community to come together through that. That's really awesome. Facebook, it's good for something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is what, I think that's another thing we're learning today. Facebook is, can be useful when trying to uh, properly address uh, kitchen waste. Yeah. Any other big barriers for folks? I know we also chatted about uh, apartments today and the differences between apartments that are on with a private company and uh, households who are with the city. Uh, so that's even a difference right there if you don't even have just an access point right away to uh, multiple different time, types of recycling bins for your house. But any other ones coming for people? My cousin lives in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, New York. And they just have like, I want to just say it, like they have like the greatest trash ever. <laughs> when people either move out or, you know, depending on how, what income level they're at, when you look at their stuff for trash night, there are literally groups on Facebook again that like post like, look at this great furniture, it's like great furniture, books, children's like crib stuff, like kitchenware, shelves, sofas, you know, like literally like somebody threw out like, uh, like working TVs, you know, and stuff like that. It's just crazy, especially with the pandemic because everyone like, because it's very expensive to live there people move to other states because it's cheaper and they can do re remote work. So the last year's and this year, this year too, I guess, their trash, <laughs> whatever, are like super, super treasures, if you will. You see these um, furniture pieces that are like marble and gold and whatever. And you're like, if you bought that online, that would be like $6,000. And people would just throw it out. Like it's literally on the street, just waiting to be picked up by the garbage people and stuff. And it's so weird. I don't know. Wow. Yeah. I would love to go dumpster diving there. <laughs> like, yes. You yes. make a pretty penny doing some yes. dumpster diving there for sure. Yeah. I bought sushi from a local. I had a pet, pet sit for her one, one, two weeks, a couple of years ago. And I bought sushi from a local market. And then I was walking her dog <laughs> later that night. And this man was just like dumpster diving. I had never seen that in person before. <laughs> and I was shocked, but yet like, really angry at myself that I just spent $12 on sushi that he's literally picking up cases up on the ground. 
anyway. I think in the um, Northern context, the apartments, but also the access to these facilities is really important. So I live only 20 minutes outside of Prince George. And of course there's no curbside recycling, um, which means whenever you wanna recycle things, you have to go either to the nearest transfer station or to the return it itself. So we end up having to make like two car trips for every kind of load of recycling that exists. Um, but that can be really challenging for people who are living with disabilities or people who live further out of town. So I'm not that far from town, <laughs> um, but for communities then that also don't even have curbside recycling and have elderly folks, people who have young children, like, you know, there are ways to organize these as um, fun activities with kids, but it's still often challenging <laughs> to, you know, get everything together and organized and then to move everybody to, you know, this place that isn't necessarily safe because there's big cars moving around. Um, but not all communities have return it and transfer stations like we do here in Prince George. And it's important to recognize that people in those communities don't necessarily have the wheels to get to those places. And so I think whenever we're talking in a Northern context, and this is true, not only for Canada, but for other remote areas as well, transportation is a huge and, and spatial distribution of facilities is a huge issue for folks. And I'm really lucky because it's not a challenge for me because I'm not super far out and I have a vehicle. Um, but, you know, that's space is a big barrier, space and time. So, is it yeah. possible to write the local congress or council, con whatever, government person, official, local, whatever, <laughs> and just say, like, we are interested in doing this because it's better for us as humans and as a city, as a municipality and all that? Well, I think that's really needed in um, uh, the community near us, about 200 kilometers just to the west called Vanderhoof has no curbside recycling at all. And all of theirs has to go to one dump in town that acts as the transfer station um, and dumping facility. So that community is really in need of it. In Prince George, we're lucky now that we have curbside within the city, but I doubt they're going to extend that beyond city limits because it's such um, a costly process. And COVID has really hit <laughs> the city finances rather hard. So, <laughs> but yeah, anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so quite a few barriers out there for sure. Uh, but there are other resources out there as well. And we've shared a few today um, that can help. and. We'd love it if you have resources that you know of, if you could drop them in the chat to share, that would be great. Um, so we can create more of a hub of resources that we can also share. We'll put, we'll put out a follow-up email after this event with all those resources. So yeah, please do drop those in the chat. We've only got five minutes left. So I am going to pass it back to Helga to wrap up for today, but please put those resources in the chat. And also if you're looking for certain resources, also put out those questions in there and we'll we can see what we can do and other folks who are on the call as well. Please do feel free to help them out as well. So, yeah, thanks. Awesome. Next slide, Anne. Perfect. Okay, so a brief conclusion. I, mean, I feel like we've summed it up pretty well with this conversation and previous conversations, but there are a lot of ways to reuse materials before you even recycle them. Um, this is a great step to take. It's necessary in some cases because we really want to prolong the time that these materials spend outside of the long landfill for as long as possible. But we also wanna make sure that we are actually prolonging the life of that product instead of turning it into garbage that will just go directly into the landfill. And then if we can't reuse, then recycling is another important option and a really important part of the sustainable kitchen. So. Unfortunately, recycling needs a lot of educating yourself because the rules as Margaret put in the chat are constantly changing and they're different between cities, uh, between provinces, between countries. And so unfortunately, it's really a local kind of issue on what you're able to recycle and not. And then it's always important because we're in the kitchen context that all your recyclables are clean. So things like 
I, for some reason, I think about mushroom containers today. I obviously hadn't, haven't eaten mushrooms most recently enough, but all of your containers, whether it's meat or mushrooms or veggies, you need to clean those out before you put them in because that'll soil your entire um, load of recycling. And it's also just unpleasant for the workers who have to work for it. And we need to respect what they're doing for our society and give them as much help as we can. So wash all your recyclables, try and find out where they go, reuse them if possible, and just collaborate. We've heard a lot today um, about collaborating within your neighborhoods, within your smaller communities to help each other out. Um, and that's really how we're going to get through environmental issues and issues in environmental sustainability. And if we can create collaborative models on a smaller scale, we can then approach our local governments and say, hey, this is working for us. Would you mind giving a hand, <laughs> right? And so I think those are really powerful approaches. And there've been lots of links in the chat that sort of have more information or just more resources for you to bounce off of. I'm sorry for the people in the States. <laughs> this is really BC focused, <laughs> um, but I hope you know sort of maybe just what to kind of search for, for your local information. And then we're gonna wrap it up there are interesting links. They've all been put in the chat. We're gonna wrap it up with the prize draw. And I think Anne has the spinning, spinning wheel of fate somewhere. Or I that Shauna does. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing, I'll let Shauna. <laughs> so yeah, for everybody here today, uh, as you saw on that side, our two prizes today are metal bag clips and uh, reusable snack bags. And so for the person who wins this, you will be delivering those to you. Um, for everybody who attended today, you're also going to be entered into our final workshop series draw, which is an even bigger prize that is to come. So for today, uh, our winner is... And that is Leanne. I know we only have one Leanne on the call. Uh, so whichever, Leanne, you are, uh, you are a winner today. Congrats. And for that as well, in Alberta, we can uh, mail that to you. Uh, that is doable. Uh, so yeah, we will be in contact with you, Leanne, about getting that to you. All right, and then lastly, I'm sure most of you already know about our social media, but we have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And then there's our email if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Uh, we'd love to hear some feedback from you. And yeah, our social media is pretty fantastic. Hannah does a great job of keeping it interesting and jazzy. So it's really a fun place to be. We'd love to have some interaction from you all on there as well. And that I believe is our last slide. Yeah, Not correct. And, yeah, and just before you all go as well, we would love to get your thoughts on this workshop today. Um, I know some of you already know this, but this is part of a series, so we have more to come. Uh, but I'm putting a link in the chat right now to a short feedback survey. It should take more than a couple minutes, and we'd really appreciate your feedback as we do plan for those future workshops. So yeah, thanks. With that, where can we can see uh, recorded or replays? Mm -hmm. We will be posting them on YouTube. We're still in the process of getting the one from last week up on YouTube, but links to both of them will be in the follow up email today. So okay. get sent a link. Awesome. Yeah, because somebody called my house, and when the phone rings, the Wi Fi cuts off. So <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate it and for contributing to our conversation. And yeah, we hope you all learned something. I know I sure did. So yeah, have a great rest of your Saturday and stay in touch. <laughs>